Hey, Emily Y. Wu here. Today, a conversation with Nick Kapajan, producer of the documentary Help is on the Way, on the plight of four Indonesian women working as domestic caretakers in Taiwan. Help is on the Way is an Indonesia and Taiwan co-production. It premiered on public television here back in May. It's won Best Feature Documentary at Film Festival Indonesia. It's screened in Korea this summer and will be shown in Hong Kong later this November for the competition section at the Hong Kong International Documentary Festival. I had the fortune of being involved with the film when the film crew came to Taiwan for a scouting trip in 2019. Today's interview is guest hosted by Catherine Wei, a Taipei-based correspondent for The Straight Times. We'll be back next time for an episode with J.R. Wu. Enjoy. In Taiwan, they are a familiar sight in parks, hospitals, restaurants. You see them pushing old people in wheelchairs, holding babies, carrying groceries, toiling away at construction sites. These migrant workers have become a constant presence in the snapshot of everyday life in Taiwan because of their role as a crutch for the island's aging population and issues that come with it. As of April this year, there are over 700,000 migrant workers in Taiwan, and among them, nearly 40% are from Indonesia. But there's more than meets the eye. How they travel to this sliver of land to care for other people's family members. Today, we speak to Nick Kalpakjian, the producer of the documentary Help is on the Way, a feature-length 90-minute film from Indonesia that explores the nuances of working in Taiwan. You get that feeling in the training center in Indonesia, right through to even when they're employed, they are led to believe they're part of the family, but from the agent's point of view, they're just a commodity. Beyond being dealt a bad hand in life, four Indonesian women prepare to become caretakers or already work as one in Taiwan. Help is on the way one best feature documentary at the Indonesian Film Festival in 2019. It premiered in Taiwan on public television station. International labor migration is a global issue, and this is the Taiwan Take. I'm your host today, Catherine Wei. I'm a journalist with The Straits Times based in Taipei. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you very much. It's nice to talk to you today. So there's a long history of Southeast Asian workers migrating to countries and cities like Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong to be domestic helpers. But very little is known about these women and what they have to go through to prepare for these jobs abroad. Your documentary opens at a nanny school in West Java. Ada kata di badan? Tidak ada, Miss. Bekas lupa dia apa bakal ada. We watch as women are lined up and grilled about their skill sets, language abilities, and goals. They're standing against a wall, and a woman off screen is asking questions non stop and recording on a camcorder. How much do you weigh? Can you carry people heavier than you are? Do you have a boyfriend? Are you married? Have you left home before? Some of these women look embarrassed when they're interviewed. They look really uncomfortable, and well, I think one or two started crying. That scene made me really uncomfortable. I actually hated it. I think because those were really private questions that I didn't think were relevant to how well they could do their jobs. And to be honest, I had no idea until your film that such nanny training schools existed. Nick, was it a, was it a shock to you too? How did you find out about these schools and what were your first impressions? With the training center in West Java, 
it is known as a large source of migrant workers because it's an old agricultural city that has struggled financially for a long time. And so there's been a lot of trafficking of women out of that region. And then there's also the setup of the agencies to try to encourage people to become migrant workers. Personally, I, I didn't attend the school. It was Ismail and his camera assistant, Aldrian, that spent the entire time filming in Indramayu. Ismail is the director of Help is on the Way. Yeah, Ismail Fami Lubis is a long-time documentary filmmaker in, in Indonesia. Ismail is very good at connecting with people, quite an uncanny ability to integrate himself into people's lives. Um, the scene you talk about, like when they're being interviewed up against the blue wall, the first time I saw that, it was very strange. Like I didn't understand why it was happening. But then as we started editing the rest of the scenes and we discussed where the story was going, I realized how important that scene was because it's kind of like the first time these women enter the training center and then they're just bombarded with really personal questions that you wouldn't have anybody ask of you in public. So my first impressions of the training center, there was a lack of respect for the women and that was something that, that I think I felt the whole way through making the film was that the women were treated as though they were just objects being molded, ready to be sent overseas. And it didn't matter whether they had a husband or a boyfriend. It didn't matter if what else they wanted to achieve in their life. It was just that, will this person be sellable overseas? And can I recoup uh, my investment and make some money out of this, this person? I got that same feeling too. I felt like they were compared to each other like goods and how marketable they were rather than human beings. And that's kind of how s some people still see them, see domestic workers in Taiwan too. Yeah, and I think that comes out really strongly towards the end of the film when we meet the agent in Taiwan and he's having a frank discussion with uh, Muji's employer about whether Muji will stay, what's the legal rights of the employer, not thinking about the rights of Muji. And she's sitting there the whole time she can understand, but it's like she's not there. The agent and, and the employer just talk through her. And the longer the scene goes on, the more you see Muji's face just turn blank, like nobody knows I'm here or cares that I'm here. You get that feeling in the training center in Indonesia right through to even when they're employed. They are led to believe they're part of the family, but from the agent's point of view, they're just a commodity. Exactly. And I feel that on a personal level because... Uh, I felt the punch extra hard. I've seen that scene play out before in my family home. Um, my grandma needs a caretaker, and the way she talks to the agents was exactly the same. In, in Chinese, we say guai as in obedient, and they're like, oh, this person is guai because she's from Indonesia, and they'll definitely listen to you. They won't talk back. And the lady in question was just standing right there. It always was really painful for me to watch. And so so your film started at this nanny school and you tracked these women as they left Indonesia for Taiwan. But the cultures and work environments in the different destination countries are so different. Um, in Hong Kong, migrant workers are only allowed a two-week period between different employers or they need to leave the city. And some have lived and worked in Hong Kong for decades, but they never qualify for permanent residency. And in Singapore, they are the only group of laborers that are not protected by the Employment Act, and nor are they protected here in Taiwan by local labor laws. But let's talk about the women you spoke to in your film. Why and how did they choose to come to Taiwan? Yeah, I think their ability to choose where they want to go is somewhat influenced by agents' advice and then friends and peers and people they know that are already abroad. Or it's more to do with the fact that there's a a demand from a particular country. Sukma was very quickly recruited. So I think she was only in the training center for four or five weeks before she was actually offered a job. It was just more to do with the fact that there was a demand from an agent in Taiwan that needed workers very quickly. And so three of these girls were very quickly fast-tracked over there. For Sukma, it was about not going to Malaysia again because of her previous bad experience and the idea that Taiwan can offer a little bit more freedom and a little bit more easier workload. Someone like Mary, I don't think she, she made a conscious decision to go to Taiwan at all. I think she went with whatever her parents were assuming was best for her or other peers had influenced her to do. But 
I don't think she really made any any conscious decisions about becoming a migrant worker in the first place. So, mm-hmm. and what about the reason why you and your team chose Taiwan too for your documentary? The reason to choose Taiwan was was more to do with the fact that there was going to be a government mandate to try to improve relations. For us personally too, there had been you know really great film made from the Philippines in Hong Kong, and so we didn't really want to retread similar ground with Indonesians going to Hong Kong. We wanted to make a film that had a point of difference. And the other thing that we were thinking about was that we didn't want to make a negative story. You know, we didn't want to make a story about migrant workers getting abused and having a difficult time abroad. Which a lot of news stories and a lot of films made from that perspective, from migrant workers in Saudi Arabia and and even Malaysia, and a lot of illegal trafficking of women from Indonesia to Malaysia, and so we kind of made a conscious decision that we would try to look at it from a more positive angle. As it turns out, there's a lot of negativity in the film, and and there's issues that you just can't avoid. But we just wanted to steer away from the the idea that. Every migrant worker that goes abroad gets abused, and it's a terrible thing. Because there are also positive things that there are reasons that people go to do this work, and some people do have positive experiences, like like Tari.、Mm-hmm. I love Tari. <laughs>、um, we're going to talk more about Tari later, but yeah, I think the abused migrant worker is such an overtread narrative. That it's good to show other sides of it, and we see you flesh out these characters to show that they're more than. People who are trodden on or abused. I really appreciated that, and I wanted to talk about the four women featured in your documentary.、Uh, I really liked all of them.、Uh, they were all facing different challenges, whether back home in Indonesia or at work in Taiwan. So, like you said, Sukma had her employment process expedited, and she was kind of unsure about why that happened. And Mary was unhappy because of her bumpy job interviews. And Muji, Muji was hired because her employer thought she could speak English, and she couldn't in the end. And Tari is trying to prove her mother wrong and do her father right in Taiwan. So, how did you find these women with such different but moving stories to tell? With an observational documentary, it's always a little bit of luck and a lot of time. And so, we had three women from basically from the very first day, which was Mary Sukma and Pia. We were sort of leaning towards Pia's story because she was looking to go abroad for the first time because her husband's business had failed and they'd mortgaged their house and they really needed to get money abroad and it seemed like she would、um, represent quite well the type of character that the kinds of stories that we were thinking about and we were also looking probably not too subtly then at how that represented the male side and so. She was going to become the major breadwinner, as well as looking after the children and taking on all all that sacrifice. And she she fell pregnant during her training, and so was basically asked to leave or had to leave the school, and then fell into more debt. We we weren't able to continue filming with her because basically her husband didn't allow it. So when Sukma very quickly got hired, that time we also really wanted to follow Sukma through the whole process into Jakarta, into Taiwan. So we could really get a full picture of what it means to be recruited, trained, and then placed. We had to use backdoor pressure in on a government department in Indonesia to get access to the training center in Jakarta, and then we tried a number of different ways in Taiwan to get access and permission to film in Sukma's family that she would be working with, but we weren't successful. So you had to do all the scouting or the auditioning beforehand, and when you got to Taiwan, you. Kind of hit the ground running with production and with filming. So filming a documentary like yours is very intrusive. You have to go into people's homes, and you're asking these migrant workers and their employer families to let you film their lives. You're in their faces, essentially. Were there some sensitivity or privacy issues that you had to deal with? You had to overcome. Yeah, I, I guess the biggest one was working with Muji and and the family of Catherine, and we had to be quite sensitive there because. Anna, the the elderly woman that Muji is caring for, was suffering from Parkinson's and was was unable to communicate with us, and it was very difficult for us to understand whether she was accepting of us in the family. We could only rely on on her daughter Catherine. In the hospital too, the challenge was that 
we couldn't show the faces of any of the patients or any of the people that were being cared for by Tari and her, her peers. Uh, so we had to creatively manage how we filmed Tari feeding somebody or caring for someone in a bed if we couldn't show that person's face. You know, I think it's quite obvious in the film that the camera steers away from people's faces, but at the same time, it's Muji's story. It's not actually Catherine's or Anna's. It's just that Catherine and Anna are part of Muji's story. So you you try to keep that in your mind when you're filming and you try to keep that in your mind when you're editing so that when Catherine watches the film, she doesn't feel like we manipulated or intruded on her personal life and misrepresented her because... I, I don't believe we did. I think we represented everyone in the film very fairly. Mm -hmm. And I know you said as a crew that works on international films a lot, you don't really consider language a barrier, but I'm still curious about that, uh, about the obstacles presented by language barriers, because in downtown Taipei, we meet Muji. Uh, she takes care of her employer, Catherine's elderly mom, who you said had Parkinson's, and this, this person is fixed to a wheelchair. So the communication was really complicated because you spoke to Catherine in English, she spoke to Muji in Mandarin, and Muji talked to Ishmael in Indonesian, right? So did you, feel, did you get the feeling that some things got lost in translation or went to miss when the footage was being edited? later you could finally piece together what was going on in certain scenes um yeah th things always get lost in translation but in this particular film the most important conversations were between muji and ismail so long as those two understood each other everything else could be worked out in many ways the conversations with Catherine always involved logistics and what we could or couldn't do with muji and anna and so often uh, my role might have been to remove Catherine from the situation so that Muji felt more comfortable talking about her life just with Ismail present. Many other times, Catherine would know that and would just remove herself. She would set something up and then say, oh, I just need to go and run some errands or I've got to go do whatever. And she would disappear and we would let Ismail and Muji just continue on. So really, that communication was the most important. There are many frustrations in editing a foreign language film because you get everything translated, but Indonesian language is also very loose and based on context. And so what somebody translates as being what happened from a literal perspective might be very different. So I might be editing a scene and working off the translations and I think I'm really killing this scene. And then Ismail comes in and says, it didn't happen like this, you know. <laughs> This, this, is, this is actually what it meant. You know, I know that's what she's saying, but the actual interpretation of it is this. So there's actually two sets of labor laws here. One is for migrant workers and another for everybody else. And at one point in the documentary, Catherine is discussing with an agent the possibility of finding alternative help if Muji wants to take time off. And the agent just goes ahead and admits that this is a negotiation that lands in a gray area. And Catherine says, oh, I don't want to think about it. And on the other hand, when Muji did take a day off on an earlier occasion, she came home and she was told that Anna wasn't able to cope with her absence. So from my understanding, labor agreements between the two governments don't actually require days off for Indonesian migrant workers in their first year of employment here in Taiwan. And starting from the second year, they get one day off each month, but their pay will be docked accordingly. So if, if you take a day off, you don't get paid for that day. So for this reason, many women choose to keep working. And while making the documentary, have you heard from migrant workers themselves about how they feel about this law? Yeah, I can't really, I can't really talk for them, but my impression from Muji uh, would be that it's more than a soft pressure and, and the idea that Muji takes one day off and then she's told that the woman can't, couldn't handle it is a guilt trip from the employer. Um, but the flip side to it is that Muji is the one that has to deal with the problem. So if Anna can't handle Muji being away because she's not cared for correctly while Muji is away, let's say, then Muji is the one that has to spend the next days or weeks or however long it takes to get Anna back to a situation where it's comfortable and manageable for Muji. So 
in some ways, I guess, they have to make a decision on what becomes easier for them to do. Is it easier just to keep working or is it worth the pain of creating that that situation to, to take time off? I mean, I find it quite incredible that a law in a developed country can stipulate that someone gets one day off a month and it's unpaid or they get docked for it. I mean, it's disgraceful that no matter what you do for a job that you can't be allocated suitable time off. I mean, you can't be sick, you can't have a holiday, your personal leave then becomes at the discretion of, of the employer. And to me, that just sounds like, you know, modern day slavery. Hey, from all of us at Ghost Island Media, we hope you're enjoying this episode. The goal of the Taiwan Take is to bring you in-depth conversations on matters important to Taiwan and as they relate to the world. We were recently nominated for a News Podcast Award at the Excellent Journalism Award in Taiwan. To help us speak to more people, donate to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Taiwan. Now back to the show. I really want to talk about Tari because she really left a, a fantastic impression. So here we have Tari. Tari works in a nursing home in Jai in southern Taiwan. She's deft, a quick learner, and really good at what she does. What may be surprising to viewers is how there's a side to her that most people don't associate with migrant workers. She's on her way to earn a degree from community college. She's an avid reader who also writes, and all the time she's working full time at this nursing home. This wasn't mentioned in the documentary, but Tari's actually won a prize at the New Taipei City Literature Award for New Immigrants in 2018. And what especially stood out to me about Tari was how was when she was telling a fellow domestic worker from Indonesia what Taiwan represents for her. She says, this is not only where wages are better so you can treat yourself to a better life. It's also somewhere you can become a better, more complete version of yourself. And this positive outlook really made her shine in that moment. It felt like she could land on her feet in the direst of circumstances for me. So why don't you tell us more about Tari? What was her life like before she came to Taiwan? And what were some of the things that happened to her in Taiwan that brought her to where she is right now? Yeah, Tari, I think for us, represents like the dream of Indonesian migrant worker women, that they can go abroad, they can land in a job that pays well, that gives them some freedoms, that allows them to express themselves more freely and experience life outside of, of your own country. I mean, that's not just a goal for, for Indonesian women, it's a goal for people all over the world. That There's, there's a whole group of us that, that do like to explore other cultures and find fascination in putting yourself into the unknown. And I think Tari is, is one of those people. Um, sadly, like Tari was planning on, on returning to, to Indonesia in August this year, uh, when the whole COVID scenario unfolded, the hospital that she worked at and the agency requested that she, she sign on for another contract. And she did. So she'll be, she'll be there for at least another two years, possibly three. And that's, causing some friction at home because her mother didn't want her to go on this last trip of working as it was. And now, to, and so now to find out that it's been extended again, that's difficult for her own mother to understand. And it probably widens the gap between her and her, her child in Indonesia, who's now 20. They already have a fractured relationship, I guess, because Tari has, has been so distant. And while Tari justifies it by the fact that she couldn't support her child if she was in Indonesia and put her child through school and, and do the things that she needs to do. It does come at the expense of, of the mother-child relationship. So, yeah, I guess another reason why I think, you know, Tari is quite representative of the sacrifices that people make to go abroad. It's not that they just want to go abroad for the for the experience, the dream. It's, it is to pay for their children's education or it's because they're their husbands have left them for someone else and, and dump the children with them or lump the children just with them. 
Uh, I wanted to ask, were there others that you met who were like Tari, who you felt would add a lot to the story, but you had to leave out of the documentary? Yeah, there, I mean, there was quite a lot of great women that we met. Um, there was a woman, Kindi was her nickname. She was working full time, similar to Muji, in a private home. But she was also active in the community and quite active in art and producing cultural works from Indonesia and mixing Indonesia and Taiwanese culture. And she was quite passionate about advocating for migrant workers that come to Taiwan to not just stay within their own community of, of Indonesians, but to really take the opportunity to explore the country you're in, learn as much about Taiwanese culture as you can, make Taiwanese friends, like expand yourself. She was someone that we would have liked to have spent more time with. Um, we were also talking with another woman, Amanda, Amanda Leo, who was running an organization that was a support network for domestic workers who had troubles with their employers or agents. And they act as a halfway house and, and try to step in and help negotiate any problems that are arising before it needs to escalate to a court situation. Um, she was quite a, an interesting woman to talk to, too, and was quite passionate about human rights and the rights of domestic workers. Mm -hmm. And what do you want the audience to walk away with after they've watched the film? I want them to realize that these women are not just commodities. They are real people like you or I. They come from somewhere and they have somewhere they want to go. And so it's, it's our responsibility to ask the questions of these women and to get to know them and to understand what it is they're trying to achieve in their life. So it's it's about forming personal connections with people that are a major part of your life. And I guess secondly, I think there needs to be change. I think people need to actually voice their opinions on how these people are being treated. The systems that have been put in place that are not for their benefit need to be dismantled. And we need a more transparent system. And I think if people can watch the film and not be yelled at that this is what's wrong with the world, but to come away and think, yeah, that there is something not right about this system and I should, I should be part of the change. So whether it's getting involved with the NGOs like Migrant Care and others that are acting as a voice for migrant workers or whether it's asking the questions of the women that work with them to better understand and then keep the conversation going, I think... All of us can do or play a small part in, in fixing the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know the documentary is doing pretty well. It premiered on May 7th in Taiwan on PTS, and it has it won the Best Feature Documentary Award in Indonesia. Uh, how has the reception been in Indonesia? Uh, yeah, Indonesia has been really, really interesting. No one could have guessed the situation of, of COVID and we had planned a, a release strategy that was based on premiering at the Taiwan International Documentary Festival in May, which would then be followed up with the PTS release a few days later. And then we would come back to Indonesia and hold a big premiere screening like we always do, and then roll it out on, on the GoPlay platform here. But all that got washed away. So we, we launched on PTS and then about a week later, the GoPlay platform uh, released the film online. And so we had to think about how we present the film to the public here without that big premiere as your usual. So what we started to do was connect with high school and university teachers and develop a campaign where we would ask the teachers to share the film with the students. We probably got 25 or 30 different teachers to screen the film to almost a thousand students right throughout Indonesia. And because of COVID, teachers were really looking for things that they could engage their students with online. And so watching a film and then holding online discussions and webinars was something that the teachers really grabbed onto. And the, the really exciting thing for us is that we can actually see the physical results of people watching the films because the students write about it and they love to write about it on their Instagram accounts and they screenshot the film and they share it with their friends. So to see the film spread amongst, you know, the 15 to 25 year old age group, which may not usually watch documentaries at all in Indonesia and specifically films about social issues, it was really, really warming for us to see them getting so much out of the film, discussing the issues that we thought were important in the film and, and actually understanding the issues. And I think, I think it was relatable for them because 
in Indonesia, the middle class, everybody has help. You know, we've all got nannies or cooks or drivers, and that's not foreign. And so I think they started, or people were able to watch the film and then reflect, oh, have I ever actually asked my nanny where she comes from? Or have I asked my nanny, how's her husband? Or what does he do back in the village? Or how are your kids? You know, how are the kids in your school? And I hope that people were having those kinds of conversations at home because they were the sorts of things that, that we were thinking about while we were making the film. And we didn't grow up with nannies in Australia, but my kids have grown up with nannies in Indonesia. And so it's been really important for me that if my kids are going to spend this much time with this woman, I, I want to know her on a personal level. I want to know what sort of person she is and where she comes from and what she believes in and what her dreams are so that I can be part of that conversation and, and understand the involvement with the kids. Mm -hmm. And have you kept in touch with Sukma married Muji or Tari? Where are they now? I've connected with Muji and Tari on online. Sukma and Mary, it's a, it's a bit more difficult to maintain contact with because they're not as confident, I guess, in their roles where they're working. Whereas Muji and Tari have been doing it for a long time. They've developed a strong relationship with their employers. Their employers have given them time to be involved in the film. Um, so when we had a press conference last week, both Muji and Tari appeared on the press conference alongside uh, members from Migrant Care and the Ministry of Manpower and, and other organisations. And so we've kept in touch with them from a personal point of view, but also from a point of view that this film is really their film. And I know you mentioned this earlier, but we want to know what your next steps are. What are you working on right now? In relation to this film, we are trying very hard to develop, and I'm not going to call it a sequel, but we want to see what happens when the women return home. What are the challenges that lie waiting for them when they try to assimilate back into Indonesian society? How they put their, the money they've earned to work, how they go from what they feel is quite a liberal society in Taiwan to what is quite a conservative society in Indonesia? What are the expectations that are placed on them by their family and friends that see them returning with, with a lot of money? And I think Tari told us the other day that the expectation is that when they come home, they buy a big house and a car, and that proves that they're successful. But then what? I'm like really looking forward to that. Might be a few years. <laughs> this, this, one, this one took almost three, so let's see. <laughs> so that was all my questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Ah, thank you very much for having me. It's been great to talk. Thanks, Nick. This is Catherine Wei, and this has been The Taiwan Take. Today's episode is produced by me, Emily Wai Wu, researched and hosted by Catherine Wei, editing by Ali Morimoto and myself. Catch you next time with an episode from J.R. Wu. This has been a Ghost Island Media production based in Taipei, Taiwan. Thanks for listening.